Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this Ask ICAST webinar. This is, of course, the series of webinars which gives you, the members, an opportunity to find out more and ask questions from not only in-house experts here at ICAST, but also our guests on a range of topics. For those that don't know me, I'm David Mingus. I'm the Director of Practice here at ICAST, and it's my great pleasure to be guiding you through this webinar today. I do have to mention, uh, as I do always at the top of these webinars, that the webinars provide general commentary on the topics under discussion. And as always, uh, you should use your own professional judgment and seek other appropriate professional or legal advice uh, where that's appropriate when dealing with any of the matters under today's topic discussion. Accountancy practices will always face risks, but the form and severity is certainly likely to change over time. The risks will vary for those practices that are just starting out against those that are growing or indeed when the principals in the practice are looking to sell or merge the practice or indeed just retire. But what are the risks at each of the stage? How do they vary and how do you go about identifying and quantifying such risks? More importantly, how can you de-risk and protect yourself, your staff and your business? Well, to help answer these questions and more, I'm delighted that once again, we're joined by Ed Partridge, Senior Vice President at Marsh Commercial, and he's able to join us on today's webinar. Ed has more than 18 years experience in the insurance market, specialising in working in partnership with organisations to develop and deliver bespoke insurance solutions for their members and clients. Ed looks after the Bristol Centre of Excellence, which is a core specialism in professional services sector and in particular accountancy practices. So, Ed, welcome uh, to today's webinar and thank you for joining us. Before I hand over to Ed and uh, he'll take you through uh, the, the main topic of today's presentation, just a few housekeeping matters to remind you of. Uh, you can, of course, submit questions at any time through the question and answer facility, which can be accessed in the live Q&A area at the right hand side of your screen. Questions can be submitted anonymously um, or only to the presenters of the webinar if you wish. And uh, when we are asking the questions, we won't identify who they come from. So today's a great opportunity to uh, get forward your questions and uh, get those answered. So do please take advantage of that facility. You can also leave comments or discuss with other attendees um, of today any of the content in the discussion forum area, which is also accessed at the right hand side of your screen. We will, of course, be recording the webinar and we'll be making it available for on demand viewing afterwards in case either you want to refer back to it or indeed share it with others. And indeed, the slides from today will also be available to accompany the on demand video at icast.com forward slash webinars over the next few days. So look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of uh, this morning's webinar. And of course, we will try and get uh, to as many of those as possible. But in the meantime, Ed, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, David. And good morning, everybody. I hope you are all well today. And uh, thanks for taking the time out of your day to uh, to come and listen to today's webinar. So um, as David has suggested, what we're going to look at today is the life cycle of a practice and the risks that you need to consider as you set up, grow your business, and eventually think about your exit strategy. So we're gonna to look to identify those risks, give you some practical advice that manage those risks through best practice, and also the insurance considerations that you uh, need to be thinking about at every step of the way. So let's start off by looking at the beginning, what you need to consider when you're starting your practice. Best practice is first and foremost, the first thing I wanna cover off here. So evidence, processes, and clarity with your clients on the activity you are undertaking for them is absolutely critical. Insurers will want to see solid risk management processes and ensure that you're clearly engaging with your clients. Now, many startups are created through acquisition and purchase. So taking on an existing client book is an excellent way to springboard your own venture but it does come with its own risks and, and considerations. And it's very important to consider what past liabilities you may be inheriting within that book. So profession indemnity is underwritten on what's called a claims made basis. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention that quite a few times today. It's a really important point to consider. What that basically means is that it's the insurer who's on cover 
when the claim is notified who is responsible for considering the claim. So as a result of this, any claims for previous business activities that a business you have acquired has undertaken will need to be considered under your current insurance policy if you are responsible for that business's past liabilities. So it's really important to consider this point if you are taking on a business, uh, business's existing clients. The work you undertake is also obviously really important in terms of understanding um, with your broker that the cover is adequate for that. So when setting out your business and importantly establishing what your, best, your business activities are, it's really important to ensure you engage with your broker, all the information you have has been shared with them on what you will do, who you're going to do it for, and importantly, what percentage of your overall business that equates to. Um, and it's important as well when considering about purchasing insurance to give yourself quite a bit of time to get all the information together and, and also expect to answer quite a few more questions. Um, we're in quite a hard market at the moment. I think I'd, I'd be doing my industry a disservice if I, if I didn't mention that. And that effectively mean that, means that there's a lack of capacity and unfortunately in some sectors increasing costs and an apprehension from some insurers to provide cover so what that basically means is that things can take a lot longer to find cover in the market for certain activities which we'll cover a bit later on um, so engage early have all the information ready but just expect things to perhaps take a little bit longer than you may have expected um, and just give yourself time to, to, to place cover. Larger owners contracts as well as something uh, that's absolutely critical in ensuring your insurer is aware of. Um, so just as important as making sure your broker knows the work you do, it's really important to make sure they're clear on your larger clients. These by their nature can pose more of a risk to your business if something should go wrong. And your insurer will want details of the activity you undertake for your top, your top contracts, um, the value to your business, um, and the percentage of your overall turnover that it represents. So it's important to have that information to hand and, and consider when you're you're looking at uh, purchasing cover and setting up and managing a risk from the start. Sanctions, us uh, obviously a, an awfully raised topic at the moment, unfortunately, uh, and, and the profile has has risen for obvious reasons. Um, many brokers and insurers are having to withdraw from covering contracts that are undertaken for sanctioned individuals or countries. So this can expose you in the event of an error or omission if coverage is provided. So you need to be really sure you understand how you might be exposed in this particular area and consider whether or not you can continue with certain business activities. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's really important to think about that. What insurances do I need? The million dollar question. Um, We'll get into that detail a bit later on in the presentation because there's actually quite a few different considerations we need to take into account there. Um, so we'll, we'll cover it off in a, in a couple of slides at times. And also, am I correctly covered? As your business grows and you start to diversify your activity, you need to constantly think if you are correctly covered. And also, as you take on more material assets, you need to ensure you have adequate insurance in place. And again, we're going to cover this in a bit more detail as we proceed through the presentation. Okay, so insurance priorities, um, profession indemnity. As I mentioned before, I'm going to keep mentioning it because it's a really important point to consider. PI is underwritten on a claims made basis. So it's the insurer who is uncovered when the claim is notified who's responsible for considering the claim. That means you need to maintain cover throughout the life cycle of your practice to ensure all previous activities are covered. As the slide says, PI is a regulatory requirement, but above and beyond this, it will protect you for errors and emissions as a result of the work you undertake um, and the financial impact that any errors or emissions could create. Um, it's in crucial insurance to have when your business is based around giving advice to clients. So it's really something you do need to consider. Employees liability, um, EL as it's referred to, this covers bodily injury or disease sustained by employees in the course of their employment. Again, it's a legal requirement for you to have that if you have staff. There are a few nuances that you need to consider depending on your trading style. So for example, whether you're a sole trader or a limited company, um, it may be or may not be required for you to have employees liability. So it's really something to think about um, discussing with your broker. In a limited company, for example, directors <coughs> excuse me, are classed as employees. But there are some instances where EL isn't required when you're a limited company. So for example, if you're a husband and wife business team, um, one of you is a director and one of you is a company secretary. Um, in that instance, employer's liability isn't always required. So there's a few things to navigate when it comes to there, but because it is a legal requirement, it's crucially important to get it right. Um, so again, speak to your broker um, who should be able to advise you based on your own specific circumstances, 
whether employer's liability needs to be a consideration for you or not. Um, motor insurance. Everybody knows about motor insurance. Very standard. It's a well-known insurance. But a lot of policies don't necessarily provide cover for business use. So if you travel to see clients, you need to consider whether or not you're actually covered to make that trip. Um, so again, talk to your insurer, talk to your broker, make sure you've got business use covered on the policies so, so you can get out and see your clients and, uh, and you're covered if something should happen on the way. Um, so those are the kind of top three that you need to think about, but there's quite a few other ones that are important to consider as, as you go through um, setting up your business and, and growing your business. So MLP, Management Liability Portfolio, sometimes called Directors and Officers Cover or DNO. Uh, this covers directors and officers, as it would, as the name suggests, of the business for certain actions that might be brought against them, you in your personal capacity um, for the running of the business. So for example, health and safety executive investigations is, is, is one that we uh, we see quite often coming up in, in certain sectors. Public liability, PL, um, this provides cover for third party property damage and bodily injury. So if you visit a client's premises or you have clients visit yours, uh, this really should be considered uh, something as simple as a client tripping over a bit of loose carpet that, that can really result in quite a significant claim. And that's the kind of thing that public liability uh, would cover. For a lot of non-manual businesses, public liability isn't always something that's at the forefront of your mind, but it's something that you are still exposed to and you need to be thinking about covering. Office cover. So this will cover your assets, buildings, any improvements you've made to perhaps to a building that you rent as opposed to own, um, your computers, laptops, um, business interruption and fee protection, which we'll, we'll, we'll cover in a second. Um, but very often, the office cover is where you will find liability cover. So employer's liability and public liability. So it's quite easy to package all that together for you. Um, cyber, really important to start thinking about this. It's it's an emerging risk in as much as it's emerging still that people are starting to consider the impacts it could have on their business. So I'm gonna go into a bit more detail on this topic because it is really, really important. And um, there's a few nuances as well within policies that you need to consider when buying cover, when buying cyber insurance, that could potentially leave you exposed to probably some of the most common causes of cyber loss. So we're, we're gonna cover that off in a bit more detail. Um, I mentioned fee protection earlier on, business interruption. This covers your income following a material damage claim. So if there's a flood in your property and you weren't able to trade, um, your loss of revenue fees will be covered by business interruption cover. Sometimes you might not necessarily want full BI cover, business interruption. Um, increased cost of working is something that is sometimes more suitable for office-based businesses. Um, what this will do is give you a sum of money after a material damage claim like a flood um, in order to get you back up and running quickly. So whether or not you need to go and buy a load of new equipment quickly or you need to get some uh, specialist cleaners in to make your offices habitable again. Uh, increased cost of working cover rate gives you access to those funds and gets you up and running quicker. And what it actually helps to do is reduce the potential cost of the claim under the business interruption section. So um, it means it kind of looks after itself and kind of works together well in, 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 in the scope of the wider policy. Tax and legal helplines, pretty self-explanatory really, isn't it, by the name, but these give you access to tax advice and legal advice. And quite often the tax helpline will also help you with queries that you may have from your clients with regards to tax that you're not necessarily sure of the answer on. Um, at Mars Commercial, we provide access to market-leading helplines for our policyholders. Uh, but these do also appear in other policies such as office insurance. So standalone or embedded into other covers is something that uh, that you might well have access to and it's certainly worth having a look and seeing uh, if, see if it's of use to you. So um, I said I was going to mention cyber attacks in a bit more detail. Now these really are on the rise. Um, got some pretty I guess quite morbid statistics for you here already. So in 2021, 38% of small and micro businesses in the UK identified security breaches or attacks. Of these, 27% were attacked at least once a week. Reassuringly, 22% of these businesses did take measures to stop future attacks. Um, we're going to explore some of these, these measures in this webinar in a bit more detail. 
the thing is with small and micro businesses particularly they do make really easy targets for cyber criminals where in many cases they don't necessarily have the protections that large or large organizations have you hear about the larger organizations that are being targeted because they make the news but smes are absolutely in the sights of cyber criminals and you really do need to be taking some considerations to mitigate your risk and exposure there and also think about cyber insurance which will provide cover um, for certain perils and um, so loss of income loss of business uh material damage cover in the event of a cyber attack so some things to think about um in terms of managing your cyber risk <clears throat> excuse me so keep work and personal devices separate that's really important always connect to the internet via a secure network if you can uh, avoid the exchange of sensitive corporate information um, through possible insecure connections. So, for example, don't send things to a private email address if it's, if it's business related. Keep, keep, try and keep it within your networks. Uh, think about your data at rest as well. So, local drives, do they need, do they need to be encrypted? Keep antivirus systems up to date um, and, and schedule the updates. I was actually doing a presentation earlier on this week and an update popped up on my screen to, to update my um, the protection on the, on the laptop. And I was slightly worried it was going to cut everything off, but I had to hit, I had to hit go because I, I couldn't be a hypocrite and uh, tell everybody to schedule the updates and then ignore them myself. But um, one thing to think about when, when putting updates into your systems though is to actually advise your staff that it's going to be happening. Um, one type of cyber attack does actually imitate a um, cyber protection system update to your system so it can actually expose you so if you're informing your teams of when updates are going to be happening um, it mitigates the exposure for accidentally clicking on something that isn't a genuine update um, try not to share virtual meeting uh, links on social media um, try and keep it you know to, to specific audiences and be mindful of keeping social media and private passwords the same as business passwords. If you're unlucky enough to get your, I don't know, your Facebook or your LinkedIn account hacked with a password and you've got the same on your business computers and your business devices, then you've obviously also there exposed your business. So think about keeping those separate and keep them private and keep them complicated and not, not easy to remember if you can. Turn off home listening devices as well, such as your Alexa. Um, hackers can get into those and actually listen to what you're talking about and obviously get quite quite important information from you. So it's really important to, to turn those off when you're, you're having business type discussions. Um, take guidance on how to destroy hard copy information. There are a lot of businesses that specialize in the removal and destruction of sensitive information. So it's certainly worthwhile looking into that. And also try to think about using multi-step validation to help protect against hacking at the logging in step. So for example, you put in a password, you, it sends you a code, the code gets to your personal device, you don't have to add that back into the system. It's a really, really clever way of making sure that the system is validating you are the person trying to log into it. And also train staff on how to spot and report phishing email attempts. So this is when somebody sends an email to um, you or a member of your team um, pretending to be somebody else by basically trying to get access to an invoice to be paid or trying to get access to uh, your, your company systems. So think about this, who is the email from? Does the email address look right? Why are they asking for that information? Um, are you expecting to hear from that person? And it can sometimes just be a little full stop or a letter different in the in, in the actual email address itself, which can really highlight the fact that this isn't a genuine uh, genuine um, contact from a client. Now, cyber insurance does have one nuance um, around phishing uh, email scams, which we really really need to consider when purchasing cyber insurance. So, phishing is actually considered social engineering, which is considered to be a crime. Um, a lot of cyber insurances exclude crime. So therefore, by that nature, exclude phishing and social engineering and, and email scams. So a lot of the policies that we provide, we can include that cover and crime cover is available as a separate. But it's really important if you're purchasing cyber to be clear on whether or not crime cover is included within it. Because again, it's a really common um, attack, but it's something that isn't covered in all cyber insurance policies. So it's really important to be clear and uh, understand whether or not you are you are covered for that. Okay, so plenty of things to think about there as we set up. So what do we need to now think about as we are growing the business in, uh, and running the business? So 
you might over time start to diversify your business activities. It's really important to ensure that your broker is up to date with the things that you're doing. Um, you might do different activities with different clients and new activities as well. These really do need to be notified to your broker. So constantly ask yourself, am I doing anything new with that? my broker wasn't aware about last time we spoke to or at renewal and try not to keep the conversations with your broker just based around the annual renewal cycle um have conversations during the middle of it really you know make sure that everything's up to date and and nothing's missing taking on riskier contracts as well um this might require an increased limit of cover um or depending on the activity undertaken if it is of a high risk nature some insurers might refuse to cover it altogether so we'll come on to that in a little bit more detail later on but it's really important to make sure that um you're clear in terms of the cover that's being provided versus what it is that you actually undertake on a day-to-day -day basis and also if you're expanding your team if your business is growing or bringing more staff that's an excellent position to be in but it does give you, unfortunately, additional exposures like employer's liability that I mentioned earlier on. So think about your employer's liability exposure. Think about the training your employees are undertaking. Um, have an open door policy where mistakes aren't punished, but people want to put their hand up and say if something's gone wrong, because that's really important when it comes to professional indemnity and notifying it through to the insurer. The worst claims I've seen of some of the worst ones over my career have been where people just haven't notified it or weren't aware it had happened because somebody had hidden it away. Really damaging to your business. Um, and also think about your team's continuing professional development. So making sure that they're up to date with changes in regulation and the industry is really important to the running of your business. So look, we've covered off a few growing pains there. It's a great place to be, like I said, but it's always, always uh, certainly from my, my perspective as a broker, think about the risk and think about how your business is evolving with that risk. Okay, and here's a few um, kind of key drivers that we see occurring regularly to claims. So negligence over an admin error, quite often the advice is correct, but the execution isn't. So this can cause exposure. So thorough processes and evidence is required to protect you if a claim occurs. Um, costs, many contracts can grow and this can cause disputes when it comes to settling. So communication is key. Ensure that expectations are managed and contractual issues are avoided. Um, complaints, always notify. Always notify your broker if you, if you have a complaint that you think could potentially lead to a claim. Early notification and PI cover is absolutely key. Many policies have notification deadlines that if you don't meet, could mean a claim isn't actually accepted. So if something happens today and you don't notify it for three months, your insurer might well turn around and say they're not covering it or they're not going to consider the claim. So don't sit on a complaint. If something comes up and it looks like it could result in a claim, just notify it. There's absolutely no harm whatsoever just speaking to your broker and saying, this has happened, I'm letting you know just so that it's notified if it does develop into a claim. And you know your broker will help you. So if they don't think it needs to be notified to an insurer, we will take that up. We will take that advice on, and we will we will do what we need to do with it. But we need to know about it in the first place. Um, engagement letters as well. Be clear on the activities you undertake. That's going to help when it comes to a claim. Um, you know, in addition to establishing what you aren't going to do, as well as establishing what you are doing, and what you are responsible. For example, if you refer a client to another practice, those things are really important to consider um, when uh, when your business is growing and, and you're running it. So let's have a look at some uh, claims drivers in a bit more detail now. The top five claims drivers for accountants hasn't really altered over the past few years at all. Um, it can, of course, take time for claims to filter through, but the common claims causes that we are seeing have stayed fairly, fairly consistent. So general accountancy, quite a broad term, but things like late filing of accounts or incorrect accounts or incorrect advice surrounding VAT. So think back to the tax helplines that I mentioned earlier on, that can help when it comes to uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, and tax, this tends to be associated with a lack of evidence as to what advice was given um, and whether a duty to advise arose in the first place. So that's something to think about there. Insolvency, um, unfortunately, you know, after the back of the past couple of years that we've been through, this is, it's becoming more common that, that businesses are becoming insolvent, as, as I'm sure you all know. Um, it naturally follows the economic climate and that therefore results in increased work. With that comes increased risk. So we are seeing a lot of claims come through in that area. So something to consider if you do work in, in that section. And then also audits and you know transactional corporate finance, M&A type work, um, that they, they, they really are common causes of claims and quite heavy claims as well. So it's certainly something to be considering if you do that kind of work. Okay, so 
These areas here are what many insurers consider to be high risk activities that are harder to cover. So these are things that you need to think about if you are working in these areas. Um, if you're undertaking or planning to branch out to these areas, you need to talk to your broker as early as possible as it may well be that the more standard PI policies when accepted, meaning broader broking is required, which is going to take longer um, to ensure that you're adequately covered. Now, cover is out there, but as I mentioned earlier on, we are still in a hard market. So a reduction in capacity with an increase in premiums. So finding cover for high risk activities is more costly, more time consuming, because quite simply, less insurers are providing cover for that nowadays, because they're, they're trying to protect their own profits um, through the large claims that you see coming through these, these high risk activities. So it's really something to think about if you're getting into these areas or you do these areas, really engage with your broker at the earliest opportunity and uh, make sure you've got all the information available, what percentage of your overall turnover that relates to, um, who your clients are, um, you know, the, sp the specificness of the kind of activities that you're undertaking, really, really important. So I'm not going to read through the slide because it's up there and I believe the slides will be available afterwards. But um, what you've got there is obviously the kind of top high risk activities that insurers uh, would be concerned about and you need to uh, really be thinking about if you do get stuck into those areas. Okay, so quick summary of the next couple of slides. As your business grows, mitigate the risk with robust procedures. When it comes to a complaint, speak to your broker. Please do that. I can't make that point enough. If something looks like it could become a claim, even if you're not sure, speak to your broker. Please do that. Um, ensure open communication with clients and your staff. Like I said before, the worst claims happen when information is hidden. That can really expose you and your business and things escalate when you can't get control of them. So it's really important to make sure that open culture in your business means any issues that do arise are brought to the forefront immediately. Um, engagement letters, like we said, can you limit your liability? Be clear on the activities being undertaken. File notes, ensure there's evidence of what you've done. Is this really is going to be relied on by your broker and insurer in the event of a claim? And of course, PI insurance, protect yourself. Um, think about doing sweeps of your business to try and identify any errors or omissions. So ask your team, have you has anything happened that you haven't notified me about that I should be considering in terms of speaking to my broker about it and notifying my broker. Make sure your, 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 your staff are aware of the uh, considerations around notification periods um, if a claim should occur. So they are aware of the issues and, and the uh, impact of sitting on something, what, what that can do to, to your business. Um, and like, if you do find any errors or omissions, again, please just speak to your broker. So a few more things to consider um, as you grow. Staff retention is really, really important. Um, we're we're coming out the back of the uh, as it's you know lovingly referred to the Great Resignation, and um, we're seeing more mobility. I think of of people in businesses, people moving around a lot more. Certainly, I've seen it in, in the business areas that I look after. It's uh, it's been been challenging in some areas. So employee benefits are a great retention tool to make sure you hold on to your team. So things like private medical insurance, uh, competitive pension arrangements. These are all tools to help you keep your team as you grow and also to become an attractive employer. So they will want to know about the kind of benefits and things that they can access by, by being employed with you. Overseas travel, how exciting, but I kind of, I guess I've come across as a bit of a pessimist really, but it's great to be traveling overseas to see clients, but it can actually be quite risky in terms of the geographical restrictions and the jurisdiction limits on your policy. So <clears throat> geographically, does your liability cover cover you to travel abroad? Um, do the jurisdiction limits on your policy allow you to give advice outside of the UK? So it's really important to think about that. And uh, again, have a chat with your broker. There's a theme arising, isn't there? Talk to your broker. Um, key man insurance. Is your business reliant on key individuals who own certain contracts? What would it cost you to replace that person? And what would the impact be on the business? So key man cover is a great way of ensuring that the risk allocated to really important people in your business is mitigated from, from, from a financial perspective um, if they were unfortunately to, uh, to, to, to pass away. So it can help you with finding a replacement um, to, to keep your business going. So just a couple of additional things to, to think about there. Okay, so <clears throat> you started your business, you've grown your business. What do you need to then consider when planning your exit? And there's only really one key point that I want to draw out in terms of this from the insurance and risk perspective. So the key point here is runoff insurance. As we said earlier, 
a number of times. Professional indemnity is underwritten on a claims made basis. So to reiterate, it is the insurer who is on cover when the claim is made that will consider it as opposed to the insurer who is on cover when the event leading to the claim occurred. So what runoff cover will provide you is when you stop trading, runoff cover puts a policy in force so that if a claim is made after you cease trading, you have cover for your business activities that were undertaken when you were trading. Um, runoff cover is readily available and normally it follows the insurer who was providing cover for you when you were trading. So it's a lot harder to buy it in isolation. Um, a lot easier to buy it as an extension to your existing policy once you, once you do decide to cease trading. So um, it's really important to consider that I always kind of get a bit mystified really as to why you would buy PI insurance when you're trading, but then you just stop afterwards. Something could still come up from advice that you gave last year or the year before, even if you stopped trading today. So runoff cover is going to make sure that that cover is in force for you if that does happen and you have the protection that you hopefully enjoyed when you were actually trading. Um, and that is it. So if anybody has any questions, Obviously, please shout out. Great to, uh, great to have a discussion around some of these points. And, uh, you know, thank you for your time today. Um, I'll hand back to David for a second. Thank you. Ed, thanks very much. Uh, absolutely fascinating there. And certainly a number of points there that probably I hadn't even thought about, uh, despite my many years experience in, 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 in the sector. So always really useful just to get a, a reminder and a refresher uh about lots of the things i think one of the the key things that you you mentioned there was was really around keeping that dialogue open with your broker um you know as i said you know lots of things there that i've just suddenly thought about and or been reminded about and i think it is that that sort of you know a lot of thought is really just about it's a once a year process um yeah. you know and and i guess you know are, are you finding that's a, a key theme that, that comes across from from any of your own contacts that it they do tend to just think about it once a year yeah absolutely um it, it becomes unfortunately quite a transactional relationship at times based around that once a year purchase point and that can be can be so dangerous what what we're doing more of is automating contact points within mass commercial so we're actually sending out reminders via text message email to clients just to say you know come on we're here have you done anything are you starting anything new come and have a chat come and have a coffee with us let's just have a conversation and see if there's anything that you're exposed to um so we're certainly trying to be proactive on that point i think any good breaker will be um but yeah you know it, it's quite dangerous just to rely on that once a year piece especially with the notification guidelines that I mentioned, David, I think if, uh, if something happens in the second month of the policy and you think about talking to your broker in it at renewal, you know, that, that, that ship has sailed by that point, you've left it too long. So, you know, have those conversations in. I think crucially as well, make sure your team are aware of the importance of that. Um, you know, the importance of raising that information to you at a point in time. And like I said in the presentation, giving you an opportunity to talk to your broker about it is critical. I think that leads on to, to, to one of the questions that uh, is coming is is really around, you know, PI is often really thought about just in the context of the partners within the firms. You know, it's, it's something that the partners deal with, um, you know, and I think some of the, the, the things that you've drawn out there is really around actually the need to embed that throughout the culture of the firm. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and how, how can you embed that within the culture of the firm and how do you make employees think about it more more regularly yeah i mean training is obviously a great way of um, getting the message out there in terms of what the pi cover is for um it's really important to consider pi from a couple of angles when, when you're thinking about your team so they absolutely need to be aware that it's there they need to be aware of the requirements that it puts on you but also at the same time they need to make sure that they don't mention it to their clients if something should happen, because what that generally does happen, if if you know you're covered, it kind of entices a claim to come in and also potentially it increases the value that that person's looking for. So it's great to be aware of it, but great to also know what to discuss with clients when considering it. And one thing that we do in, in Mars Commercial, um, so take my Bristol business, for example, I've got around about 100 people in there that work for me. Um, every quarter we send an email out to all of them 
asking if they're aware of any potential errors or omissions that haven't been notified to their managers. And then at that point in time, we, we collate that together. Luckily, there hardly there hardly ever are any. I want to make that point very, very clear. Um, but, um, but we do kind of collate that information together and just make sure that um, we're covered and that they're aware of the importance of that notification piece and understanding that, you know, that cover is there and what it, what it does and what the requirements are. I think that's really, really important, as you say, to, to sort of go through that regular review process and that automation of it just to make sure that it happens. I, I, I guess, you know, always one of the risks of that is that it just becomes that sort of regular email that comes into your inbox and, you know, over time you just go, oh, yeah, fine, but no, nothing on that. Let, let's just delete it, nothing to report, yeah. move on, you know, but it is about actually just really thinking about it um, yeah. for, for, from that point of view. One of the, the key things that you mentioned, obviously, uh, in the presentation is is really around cyber. Uh, attack cyber insurance um, and I guess one of the things that I would like to, to, to perhaps emphasize is that you know this isn't just something about big big companies big accounts practices that are targeted um, you know just perhaps just to, to, to share with those that are on the webinar today I dealt with a, a, um, a, a member just a few weeks ago literally sole trader um, they have I think maybe one or two members of, of, of staff and they provided you know bookkeeping services essentially for for for, for companies um and as a result of a phishing exercise that client had ended up transferring circa about a hundred thousand to um you know a, a cyber crime uh, yeah. e effectively so just to say i guess this does not just affect large companies multinational companies you know it will affect the small practice essentially that's based in scotland or based in the uk uh elsewhere so i think it is really important and one of the things that um you know does need to be think thought about much more regularly is those cyber related claims and yeah. uh, you know i guess are you actually seeing some of those claims becoming much more prevalent than, than they have been in the past yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're, I think what we're simply seeing is notifications becoming a lot more prevalent. Um, not as many people as I like would buy, buy, buy cyber insurance at the moment, and if, it's unfortunately, you know, as as a broker, we're kind of seen as the as the cure, but prevention is obviously a lot better. Um, it's great to have cyber insurance in place, but I think there are a number of things that SME businesses need. As you rightly said, they're really in the targets of cyber criminals nowadays, but you only hear about the big companies because they're the ones that make the headlines. Um, a couple of things to think about. Um, you can send out test phishing scams to your team. So not trying to catch people out, but just trying to see if people are aware that these things happen. Um, and then, you know, we do that in martial art. And actually, if anybody kind of fails that test, what we then do is take them through a course about cyber awareness and, and, and think about your cyber risk management processes there's a lot of information available out there on how to actually set up a cyber risk management policy and you know cyber risk management training and there's a lot of businesses out there as well that provide cyber audits and they'll do penetration testing on your business to see where you might be exposed so these are all really good things to think about from a preventative perspective um, before you need to rely on on, on cyber insurance being in, being in place um, and one of the things that isn't always considered um, when it comes to cyber exposure is actually the PR impact that it can have on your business. So if you lose a lot of data, your clients are probably going to have less um, faith in you as, as a business and, and might actually want to look elsewhere. So managing the PR exposure after a cyber event happens is as important as ensuring that your financials and your business assets are covered if, when, when something does happen. So a lot of cyber insurance policies will give you access to a PR firm as well, um, just to make sure that your good reputation that you've worked hard to build up um, isn't taken away by a, a criminal looking to extort some money or some data from you. So uh, those are kind of some examples of what you can do, um, all driven from the back of notifications and claims that I see on a, on a, on a quite regular basis. Yeah, that's, that, that's great. Um... One other question um, is, is really, I guess, around that, you know, now I guess a lot of employers are now moving to a hybrid working situation. And you talked mm -hmm. a bit about, um, you know, office insurance um, yeah. in some ways, which I guess is, is, is typically thought about premise insurance in, in, in many ways. But I guess with new moves to hybrid working, are, are there other insurance issues uh, that need to be thought about uh, as, as part of that? 
Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about your material assets, if you're sending your team home with laptops, make sure those laptops are covered when they're out of your office. Um, and think about that from a risk management perspective as well. If there's more traveling um, around that isn't kind of driven from the office, just think, think about protections around encryption so if you leave your leave your laptop somewhere public make sure it's make sure it's properly covered but um all risks cover for laptops is really really important so make sure the kit that those guys are taking home with them is actually covered and also think about it as well from a liability perspective when people are coming back into the office um what we're seeing an increase in is employers liability claims as a result of businesses not um taking proper um, measures to protect their teams when they are in the office. Um, so people becoming ill with um, with COVID and then effectively putting a claim against their employer because they don't feel that their employees protected them properly. So I'm, I'm mentioning this from a hybrid perspective because working from home, I think people become a bit more relaxed around the atmosphere and the environment they're in. And then that, that kind of almost transfers into the office when you get there, that kind of relaxed approach. So it's making sure that you're really staying on top of all the things that you need to do, either from a kind of regulatory perspective in terms of you know protections, but also just protecting your team. Um, you know, we've seen a real spike in employees' liability claims as a result of that, and I think that's one, one thing to consider. Um, but also putting a positive spin on that, thinking about the um, employee benefits part of it, actually hybrid working is what people are looking for nowadays. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the market I'm in, um, a lot of our competitor brokers have insisted that people go into the office five days a week and we're, we're taking more of a hybrid approach and actually that's worked well for us it's actually worked well from a staff retention perspective but it also makes us quite an attractive employer because people want that flexibility so it can whilst it can raise risks if you mitigate those it can really be a, a, a kind of benefit for your business in terms of staff retention and, and attracting talent to your business yeah absolutely absolutely ed um one of the things you, you you mentioned earlier on there was around um your know, higher risk areas you know per perceived areas in terms of transactional stuff or corporate finance or insolvency work uh, etc one of the questions that's regularly i think put to us is you know do um insurers view the size of the business effectively uh, you know how, how much does that contribute to to the risk factor um so does a small practitioner or sole practitioner um, you know, are they viewed as much more risky than you know a national firm or uh, one of the big fours or, or or whatever, just simply because of the the size, you know, the the processes and such that they have in place. So, how much does the size contribute as opposed to the the type of work it is that that, that you're doing? So the size of the business is, is absolutely a rating factor that's going to kind of drive what, you, what your premium is going to be. So the turnover of the business, the fee income um, is going to be what your broker will put a percentage against and that will, that will drive the premium. Um, so the size is really important from that perspective. But um, it's more about what you do as opposed, to, as, as opposed to how much you do. So you can have really large businesses doing very, very straightforward accountancy um, practice. Um, which actually wouldn't therefore raise much of a concern. There's potentially a higher risk for a higher frequency of claims, but those claims might be smaller because of the type of work that's been undertaken. Flip that over to an SME who specializes in a specific high risk area. Um, they're going to be seen as a high risk business, but we can switch that around. Big businesses that focus on high risk activity um, are going to be seen as being a higher risk um, business to cover than an SME focusing on the more um, kind of day to day straightforward accountancy practices. So it's less about the size, more about what you do and how much of that you do as well. So I think a business that is 90 percent straightforward accountancy work and 10 percent high risk that might raise a bit of a flag with the broker because they're kind of thinking, well, actually, how often do you get to do that? So how robust are your practice is going to be? How um, accurate is the advice going to be if you're not giving advice on that particular topic quite often? Um, so that can also be an indicator. So it's a brilliant question. A few things to consider there in terms of, uh, in terms of the response there. 
Brilliant. Uh, thank, th thanks very much for that. I think that's has probably covered all the questions uh, that, that, that we had on this. So, um, Ed, th thanks very much for your, your insight uh, in, in, into everything today. It's been really valuable. And I know you've mentioned uh, previously that, you know, if any members do have uh, any questions, uh, want to have a review of their um, the, their insurance, their, their risks and requirements, um, you and your team are are, are more than uh, delighted to, to help out with, with that. So, Ed, th Absolutely. thanks very much uh, for that uh, just now. Um, hopefully, many work, uh, watching this webinar will know that uh, ICAS has a dedicated programme of support for practice, uh, which we call Evolve. And this covers areas including knowledge and insight, firm support, uh, promotional support for firms, professional development, and of course, practice services. That is the services that practices require. Um, I think, as you mentioned uh, earlier on, Ed, Marsh Commercial are our exclusive practice services broker for insurance and uh, offer a range of enhanced benefits in addition to the minimum uh, ICAS PII requirements. You can, of course, find out more about the exclusive benefits that uh, Marsh offer and indeed more on the wider Evolve, uh, including the full benefits guide. And those are accessed at access.com, uh, sorry, at icast.com uh, forward slash Evolve. So do please head over to, to that to get more details on that. Do, of course, please remember that you can keep up to date with the latest information guide and resources through icast.com generally. And you can, of course, access technical support through the ICAST Technical Help Desk, which covers auditing, uh, accounting, tax, practice support, AML and ethics. All the access details are available on that slide. Over the next few weeks, we've got a range of webinars coming up, which you can sign up for at the end of this month. Please do join my colleague, Justine Riccomini uh, and Jenny Morris, who is the head of National Minimum Wage team at EY, as they delve into why national minimum wage isn't as straightforward as you might think and help you navigate those complexities, pointing out the pitfalls for your clients along the way. Um, so navigating national minimum wage with your clients, a practitioner's guide uh, on the 26th of April. We also have uh, into May our ever popular spring tax updates, which will be uh, back providing with you the essential snapshot uh, of everything that you need to do with tax issues. And full details as a, of those webinars together with other uh, ICAST webinars are available at ICAST.com forward slash webinars. So it only leaves me to once again thank Ed uh, and indeed everyone who's attended today's webinar for, for joining. I hope that uh, the webinar has been helpful, been certainly thought provoking um, and uh, as I say, Marsh, uh, Ed and his team are available to, to help you uh, if you want to get further details on that. So it would be grateful to receive your feedback on today's webinar and of course hear any future topics you would like us to cover. Um, but in the meantime, for today, thank you very much for joining us and until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>